hey everybody it is office oh. hours and more importantly it is friday it is the end can you tell by the hats it yeah is we're, the we're end ready of this week yes the, i think the <laughs> office hours you see us in a lot of hats because this is currently going on and uh, that doesn't need to be on camera so you guys get hats on fridays uh, hello welcome to the show hi nick how's your week wow. what's up andrew how was yours good no <laughs> yeah <laughs> It just absolutely no. no. <laughs> um, and for those of you that are just joining us, this is a show called Office Hours. We are in a season called Back to School. We are giving you all of the tips and tricks uh, about going to back to school. Um, you guys won't notice this, but this is an entirely new Office Hours, actually. And part of the bad week is we lost everything and rebuilt from scratch. So if any... <laughs> Technical stuff is looking a little bit weird today. Uh, it was completely rebuilt from scratch uh, this morning. All right, that's the way. That's the way it goes, man. Yep, Nick. Let's talk about our community because we have an awesome community yeah. here. Um, I can see them over on my screen. Tell people how they can get involved. What office hours is? What our community is? All that fun stuff. Yeah, well, it starts here. It starts in chat, and then it kind of continues over on Discord. Uh, great little community we've got there. You can find us right there at the link on the screen, and there's homework there's discussion we have kind of like the on-air as well where we bring people on every once in a while to the show live which is yes. kind of fun uh always a fun thing to do and uh join the uh join the party there yeah it's it's like a whole party and a half um there will be some very very special stuff going down in a few weeks exclusively in the discord um and Ooh. completely unrelated to that but maybe secretly related nick there's an event coming up uh what should people go do register for uh, this event yeah i'm assuming everybody i'm looking at everybody here i know they've all signed up but if you haven't Get on board with Adobe Max. It is all virtual. It is all online. It is all free. You could just see a taste of everything that is there. Um, myself and Andrew are working on quite a bit of stuff. Quite a and, bit of um, content for y'all. I, I think at the beginning of the year we said our plan is to take over Max. I, How are we doing on that so far? <laughs> I think we're doing it. I think we're doing it, y'all. We have some big announcements coming in the next few weeks, um, but we will be yeah. doing a ton of stuff at Max for you, and you need to make sure that you are, one, registered for Max, and two, in our Discord, which is right over there. Um, Perfect. I think I have one more link that I want to share with you, and this will maybe give it, you man. all uh, an, an, a little advanced sneak peek once we get things going, and that's right here. Uh, it's just on the blank screen, so we can't tell you what it's for or what's going on there, but bit.ly slash ohcal. Uh, this gives you the uh, Office Hours calendar. You can add it to your calendar uh, in Gmail, uh, wherever. It will add to your calendar. You can sync to it, and it will show you every Friday when there is a new episode coming out, as well as during the week at a certain large event uh multiple times a day uh, there's gonna be there's where gonna be a you lot might of find us yeah there's gonna be a <laughs> lot of stuff going on to your calendar uh that week of adobe max but you can subscribe to the cal right there it will show up and then you can get reminded when we are going live here on adobe office hours all right wonderful nick i have no more announcements to do you're, you're like i am announcement out don't have any more words <laughs> um hello to the friends in chat hello nice to see you nick what are we yeah. talking about today let's just go ahead and hop in and start out the episode uh episode three yeah. of back to school episode 70 of office 70 hours. guys 70. 70 here we come what? 100 we're going to 100 how did how did that even happen i i just don't get it we're gonna do it so today um Wow, I was a little reluctant to start today's uh, show, my friend, because as a creative, there's one area of school I was never good in, and that is mathematics. <laughs> math. Math. Just math. Yes. I was no. never a mathlete. Yeah, who needs Adobe uh, I Max strive when to you be have one? Adobe Math. Exactly. Yeah. That would, ooh, that would be a whole other conference. I love it. Adobe Math. But it's funny how I'd say in the last couple of days of looking at stuff that we were going to do for today, how much of our work revolves around math and in so many different levels right i yep. mean down to the the simplest things in geometry and you name it but even like we're going to talk about visual communication and visualization um graphs and charts and grids and things like that like they go hand in hand so it's kind of neat like at first i thought this could have been a little bit of a stretch episode to be honest with you but i'm 
I think it could be the most relevant, which is really cool. Yep, just know, chat, that we are talking right now saying like, all right, we may have to stretch the content a little bit and it's going to get to like the last five minutes and we're going to be screaming trying to pack stuff in. That's how it works. We have mm -hmm. a ton of stuff to show you, um, a lot to talk about. So let's hop in. And uh, Rob is saying this is mo uh, most beneficial for our infographics oh. and our newspaper. Very excited. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Someone is in newspaper. Someone is in print. I'm, I'm a print design guy. I yeah. I started design in newspaper. So yes, we are going to be talking a lot about infographics, which will be super, super fun today uh, and show you how to leverage uh, Illustrator to do some of that. So Nick, Love let's it. hop in, talk through our lecture. I don't know if it's a lecture, but I have my button says lecture. So we'll call it a lecture. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about math and design. The common uses for sure. I mean, we just kind of talked a little bit about that introduction into it and where we can go with it. But think about these four key areas. This is kind of where they where it lives the most. Infographics, right? Like, man, that's probably one of the my favorites. I wish I did more. I don't get to do many, but I can be very appreciative of really good ones, right? Like we're going to oh, show yeah. you some incredible ones. Annual reports as well. Like I think there's that one area that you have to carry across a brand into a annual report. But the main important thing here is stressing all the financials, all the numbers and everything else. So grids, column structure, all those things very important. Then there's just visual construction. What 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 does that mean to you? Yeah, so we're going to go and talk about a little bit more, but that's like with uh, a lot of geometry, right? Which is a part mm -hmm. of math is a huge part of design. So we're going to look at grids, we're going to look at the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, we're going to look at like equilaterials and uh, equilaterials, equilaterals uh, and all oh, kinds of other words. right visual construction things that have to do with geometry and then information presentation. Obviously, if you're doing some kind of presentation where you're having to give boring information to make people care about it, it helps to make it visually appealing. So yes, uh, that's definitely. very important. And hello to a couple new names that I'm seeing yes. over here. Theo. Theo, hello, nice to see you. And Rob, Rob I believe that Rob, uh, I believe you're new. If you haven't uh, joined us before, hello. Welcome to Adobe Office Hours. Um, so let's hop in and talk about the first section, and that is data visualization. Uh, Today is going to be broken up into two separate sections. We're going to do data visualization, which is going to talk about pie charts and graphs and all that stuff. And then we'll move into geometry and design, and that will talk about low construction, grids, that kind of stuff. So let's Perfect. hop into data visualization. And Nick, what does data visualization mean to you, the idea of visualizing mm. data? <laughs> Thank you for that brief introduction. Right? Yeah, no, that's, that is kind of it. But isn't it? That is our job. I think that is our job. We are taking data and turning it into digestible, uh, easy understood data and transformation and communication, but you want flair, you want style, you want pizzazz as yep. well. So it's kind of like that balance of both. Yep, yeah, it's, it's like that. I mean, we've talked about it a couple of times that it's almost like we are translators to a visual language. And I think that math is actually probably the best place that we do this as creatives. Yeah. Uh, right? Like logo design is great. Like we can make images of donuts, whatever. But I think that math is like the most advanced translation that it's us taking yeah. like information that does not translate like spoken even sometimes and making it mm -hmm. visual. Like it's a crazy, crazy um, translation. And uh, people in chat, y'all are going off today and we like just started. Uh, so I know. Keep it up. If you have questions, if you guys want to talk, do it over in chat. That's awesome. Um, we'll be watching that as we go. So I Good. want to start as I do every episode of literally everything mm. in my life. We're talking about history. We're going back. We're going back in history all the way back to 1801 and looking at some work by a guy by the name of William Playfair. And this is known as the, the first use of a pie chart, right? Of what we know as a pie chart. Now, like, if you look at it, it it's not that, <laughs> but it is kind of noted as that. So it's a bunch of pie charts that are basically being compared to each other. So it's different categories being paired to each other, and you can see the... the uh, width of the circles on that graph showing kind of different things. Uh, but then he has specifically this one here that is talking about the uh, demographics of the Turkish empire. And it has been split into different pieces. So all the other ones are just full circles. This one's been split into pieces. And that is really the first version of a pie chart. But obviously this chart is like not, not super helpful. So 
the first thing that we really see it refined and used in a, a more useful way was uh, Florence Nightingale, 1858, almost 50 years later. Um, and yes, we've discussed Florence in the university, data visualization class. Yes, absolute legend. Uh, and so this is a, a little bit more of uh, the revolution of data visualization. And uh, she's really like the, one of the top top, top, top people uh, that were working on this. So if you want more inspiration for data visualization, Florence is the person to look up. Uh, and we right. might be going back to this later, right? We might be going back to this later. I'm going to show you guys how to do a bunch of charts and graphs in Illustrator. We'll get to this one if we have time. Um, my Wonderful. brain is saying that I do know how to do this. Um, so we'll see what happens is the answer to, to hey, that. This could just be, we'll figure it out ourselves, Who right? Knows? Um, <laughs> all right. So Nick, uh, do you want to hop into this and talk a little bit about how we can use data visualization in like our practical world, right? History is great, but we have to do it today. What does data visualization look like today? Yeah. So this is kind of what it could be used for and the benefits that it provides to the reader, basically making data engaging and easily digestible, kind of like what we said earlier. And when you think of ones that are more successful, they definitely have that combination of getting the point across being easily digestible, but also being in engaging in some way. Um, it identifies trends and outliners within a set of data. So if you're trying to prove a point, if you're using it for, for persuasion or something like that, you can identify those merging or emerging kind of things that are showing off the proof, just like this where you're seeing like glass row after row after row. Yeah. That visualization hits home without any words. So and, that's the cool idea with that. Yeah, that's really interesting to not just use it for presentation, but almost mm -hmm. use it as ammo to like persuade someone. Oh, I never yeah. thought about infographics uh, doing that, right? That it's like, oh, here's all this data. And just like any news story, especially for our newspaper friends, you can put your spin on an oh, infographic yeah. or data visualization so easily because it is that visual translation of like, cool, we can lose things in translation and we can highlight things yeah. in translation and use it to persuade people. And I've never thought about that uh, infographics doing that, but that's a hundred percent what you, what you're doing that's with it. Basically what emojis are when yeah. you think about it. Oh, right? yeah. It's kind of interesting where that came from. Um, it also helps tell that story without uh, within the data. So thinking of those incredible moments, I know when I, the only time I did an infographic, project, I remember telling my students that it had to be, you couldn't just do like, you know, um, where something comes from. It was more like, tell me something so interesting that you found in your data and you want to emphasize. And the challenge now is how do you turn that into a graphic? And it might be, you won't find an, uh, an example of it out there. It's up to you to kind of create it from scratch. That's one thing I love about infographics is a lot of times there are no versions out there that are exactly what you need. They have to be from scratch. It has to be from your thing. Yes. And they, they also reinforce an argument or an opinion. So like what you said earlier, and we were talking about persuasion and things like that. These are used a lot when you see um, different uh, in politics and all of these different things when there's something of something versus something. That is an incredible way to do it as well. And I think infographics work there is great. And then as well, lastly, they highlight the important parts of a set of data. So again, whatever is the most important part of your story and everything like that, hierarchy, visual hierarchy, all these things allow you to set the course of what's the most important, what's secondary, and what's last. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh Continuing on infographics, this is one of the most common things that we see. We're going to look at a great infographic in a second, but I want Nick, I want you to talk about what, uh, what infographic, uh, and that little, yeah. okay, do you remember, I'm going to cut back to just our talking screen. Cause I want to yeah. talk about this for a second. Do you remember the movement of like clients coming to you and being like, can we make it like, like infographic -y? Like can we do like an infographic. Do you remember that era of time? Yeah. Yeah, and it's weird. It's strangely, it's strangely coming back because I think we've seen a lot of them over the last year, right? They've yes. been everywhere, but it's coming back good for sure. I yeah. have one on the on the job market right now or on our roster. Yeah. What do you think is the draw to clients wanting those infographics so much that like those were so many inquiries that I got for a long time? Ooh. What do you what's think it was? Was it to break out of the clutter to prove the point faster to? <laughs> I'd love to. I don't know. What, it, what do you think? I think that might be it, that it was to break out of the clutter with like mm -hmm. the solution in their brain was to like with more clutter. Like, yeah, I remember just seeing infographics everywhere and it was just so much like they weren't well organized. It was just all the content. Yeah. It was almost like, uh, 
the the operations side people, right, that were outside of creative, Ooh, yes. were realizing yes. we can get so much more info into something if we do it as an infographic. So let's pack all this content. Because I remember getting content for infographics I got hired for, and I was like, this is seven yeah. pages of content that we you're trying to fit into one page yeah. with graphics and everything. Uh, and so I think that that's why I don't, I mean, I'm adverse to infographics. Um, sure. Because it, it, it kind of became a way to pack everything in. So those were bad. Let's talk about what makes a good infographic because yeah. that's important. I, and maybe it made me has, hate them less. I think another reason is just even prior to that, digital alone became a, a, a home for, for infographics, right? Yep, Other than that, it used to be in a magazine or a news, newspaper or something or on TV. Yep. Now the digital world needed it. So when you look at what makes a good one, here's that, I love the, the sweet spot thing, right? How worlds collide and when you get to that middle point there, you have something incredible. The three big key opponent, uh, uh, three, three, <laughs> Boy, it's been a long week. How you doing, Nick? <laughs> doing a good one, huh? Yeah. Uh, how are we, how we do, oh, let's just, how, let's, how let's we doing? How we doing, y'all? Let's get another sip of that espresso. How are we doing, y'all? Yeah, get that espresso going. And mm. I want to say hi to Devron. Hello, Devron. Uh, I don't think that hey. we've seen you in chat before. So that welcome like to the show. Um, and yes. with that, uh, a couple announcements while Nick gets his energy back and gets his tongue situated of how he's going to talk. If you're on YouTube right Ooh. now, uh, you're in the wrong place. Uh, come over to Behance. We're hanging out over on Behance, yeah. behance.net slash live. Click through to the chat. Leave us a red heart in the Behance chat to let us know that you are there. Um, if you're asking questions, we can't see them on YouTube, but we can in Behance. So come over there. Drop there a question. And then Wade also says, uh, I remember the time when kinetic text in motion graphics was the only thing that anyone wanted. Yes. Wow. I, that was the same thing for me was like kinetic type of like lyrics to a song or something oh, with an infographic. Right. right. Yeah. Yes. Big time. Big time. All right. Hopping back. Right, thank in. you for that break. Yes. For, <laughs> for, for the first time, Nick, do you want to tell us about what makes a good infographic? See, I needed a little break. Yeah, a little break. I love it. Just a little one. So what makes it up? Here are the three components. Accuracy, usefulness, and meaningful. Like thinking of how you put those three together. So I think accurate's a, a big one where you want to make sure all the data, all the information is truthful, is accurate, is actually correct. The usefulness of it is that audience, is the person looking at it. Does it make a difference to them? Will they be able to take away something from this and use it? And then as well, meaningful. Like, can you, it, meaningfulness to me would help persuade if it's one of those opinion things or something like that. Or if you're trying to get uh, empathy, if you're trying to show something that needs attention, that to me is meaningful. Yep. What do you think about this? Absolutely. I think that this is, this is magic. And I think that mm -hmm. clients want all of these circles a lot of times, but not overlapping. Like they mm -hmm. want them all, but like not in any kind of segment. Uh, and yeah, then that's, that's when great. it gets into trouble. You're like, I can't give you all of these if they're not overlapping and like balanced. Like there has to be some balance to this um, because it's like accurate. We want all the information useful. We want to like tell them as much as possible, meaningful. Here's like the most important things that it's like, okay, those all have to like overlap and live in, you know, a symbiotic relationship with each other. It can't just all be there. Totally. And so I love this yes. graph kind of pointing that out. Um, and I want to say hi to someone else in our, our chat. Again, it's just like all-star fun chat today. Flynn Tracy is here. If you guys don't follow Flynn, um, go over, click on that little, click on that little face next to Flynn. Give him a follow. He runs a lot of the live streams for our friends over in Australia. Um, so if you're ever Very up nice. like at night or if you're up super early in the morning with the time zone change, there's some great content coming out of Adobe Live Australia. Uh, and it does happen right here on Behance. It's just at a little bit of a different time. So you can check the schedule and see when those happen. Uh, but Flynn Very just said nice. that he did a kinetic type uh, yesterday. So yeah, stick around, watch one of the streams. All right. Excellent. Let's hop in. And uh, actually, before we get into this, let's take a look at something, Nick. Let's take a look at a great infographic. Um, I'd love to see one. And the infographic that we found is by a designer uh, whose name is right here, Elizab Elizabeta Calab Calabrito. Oh, Ooh, that's a fun name. That's a fun I name. I love that one. All right, and so wow. we're going to look at this project uh, that they did that is the European Cannabis Investment Ecosystem. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous infographic. And Nick, before we talk about the actual infographic Ugh. and case studies stuff, do you want to talk about what this style is called? Like, what is this style it, of working on? This is isometric, correct? Yes. Yeah. I, oh, my God, this is just beautiful. Right. Um, what's, oh. what's the thing with isometric? Why does it, why does it work? What's the, what's the kind of the, the zone? That's a great question. Well, once one it's multidimensional, right? Yes. I think 
there's something about that. I'm trying to think of what's the lore of it being in this, t um, that what it's not force. It, there's no forced perspective of it. It's standard perspective or listen to my great terminology here. Right. But right. there's something about it to me where I think you can move things around and it's much easier to the, the designer and maybe even to the audience because everything is linear where it doesn't, nothing gets scaled back. If you look at this piece, they're all at the same scale. Yep. And I think that's what's kind of neat. It's a way of showing depth and, and space with the same importance. Yep, absolutely. And I think that uh, we uh, we might look at it today, probably not, uh, but you can use a perspective grid. If you guys have ever accidentally turned on the perspective grid and you're like, mm. oh, what is this? How do you get away? You can build something like this using a perspective grid. Um, one of the best artists working in this style, uh, Jeremy Booth. If you aren't following Jeremy Booth, go follow Jeremy Booth. He did a bunch of work in this style, and it's really, really interesting to watch his process. Um, but this is a great example of an infographic because you can see it is making a comparison of data using visuals, right? Um, yeah. We have the heights of these boxes meaning different things uh, along with these numbers. We have the connection between each of these going through, right? That it's telling a story, Nick, like you said. It's making a good infographic because it's hitting all of those things that you had talked about. Yeah. Oh, I love the pie chart in uh, activity by investment type where it's not only a pie chart, but each he's sh they've shown here the height of it is just as is, is relevant to its percentage. Oh, that's uh, keep going. There you go. Like that to me now, boy, is that emphasizing the one that won at 42% there. Wow. Like it not only shows the value of this circle, but its height is representative of its value as well. That's pretty cool. What a great, what a great wow. infographic. This is fantastic, y'all. Um, so this is, oh, again, crazy. amazing, incredible work. Uh, Wade, that's your name. If you want to drop a link, it is just behance.net slash block like broccoli, but with an L, <laughs> Blockoli. That's my favorite thing. Oh, that's going to give me the giggles for the rest of the show. Oh, oh no. that's great. All right, so with that, um, I do want to talk about one more thing, and then... Go for it. I want to talk about one more thing, Nick. We're going to run out of time. That's what's about to happen. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. Uh, all right. That's so us. let's talk about this. Let's talk about uh, charts and graphs. Uh, actually, yes. yeah, no, let's throw up your screen real quick because you just pulled up something that uh, I want to show everybody. So this is the perspective grid. This Whoa, is what that is. Everyone's <laughs> what? What chat? What do you do when this pops up? Right. It's always heart, by accident. Heart right? rate. Like the chat heart rate just went through the roof. Everyone like it's was like, so what happened? crazy. All you have to do, though, I one day needed this to draw up a perspective of a building. And if you've never used it, it's actually quite incredible. It's literally like a snap to grid on a 3D cube. So when you have this selected, you've got this little icon here where you got both sides and the bottom. Right now the blue, which is the left, is applied. If you watch this, I literally draw with square and I instantly get something that is here in that exact area. Wow, are you, you an I mean? isometric infographic designer? Well, uh, tell me, tell me about it. Now I'm going to go to the right side, and again, now I have the same thing. So if I'm doing like a cool logo of maybe a specific building or something, now watch this. I'm going to go to the left side again, but I'll build off of this guy here and watch what it does. See how it makes the perspective here in line too. You remember in Inception when like all that weird yeah. stuff started happening? That's what that's what my brain is doing right now. Exactly. Like, watch here. I grab to this guy, and you can see you're actually building something in perspective to that piece. So what it's doing is literally snapping to grid, but on a corner, as if you had physical space. And if you've never really messed around with it a lot, I really, I really love trying this because I've built some really cool stuff. Then you know what you can do? You could take this. Now I can take it and bring it in another. Uh, file of AI without the grid on. Now it's just normal vector and I can even skew it. I can force perspective it from the bottom or the top, but it's a great way to use a grid just if you are looking for something to build and it does all of the angles to those perspectives 100% for you. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, just the best. And then magic. even at the bottom, watch. There's the, look at that. Even at the bottom. My goodness. So you have three panes. Bring that to the back. There you go. Yes, you can see how that looks. Wade here says, don't fear the perspective. Don't fear it. Just try it. Just mm -hmm. see, see what happens. There's no wrong answer. Exactly. Uh, all so right. We've so we've dispelled 
perspective grid. It is now your friend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, all right. Let's go ahead and hop in and talk about some charts and graphs. This is going to be way less fun than what Nick just did. Yeah. But I want to show you guys a little bit about math, uh, a little bit about math away. in Illustrator. So we're going to hop into uh, the actual Illustrator, which is a program that Adobe makes that we're going to use as I continue to stall and describe what Illustrator is to you. Brought to right. you by Adobe Brought to you by Adobe Sensei Technology. Mm -hmm. All right, so <laughs> we are here and there are so many types of charts and graphs. Yes, someone just said it over there. There are so many types and I wanna show you kind of just how to bring data into uh, Adobe Illustrator. So what I'm gonna do is I actually have set up a uh, Google Doc, right? This is just a regular doc. You can do this in Excel, uh, set it up. And I also, also, if you guys want a little bonus, you guys want a little extra uh, right here, uh -oh. check that out. I dropped the text file for you. So you can download the text file and follow along right now if you want to, um, or you can make your own in the future, or you can make your own in uh, a Google Sheet. So. You can see there that we have uh, the year, we have apples, oranges, bananas, cherries. These are our veggie exports, which I think that all, like none of these are vegetables. They're all fruits, but whatever. Um, and we have different numbers. So we want to visualize this data. And what I want to see is how does 2021 compare to 2020 on my vegetable fruit garden farm? So we're going to come into Illustrator here. And we're just going to start out with a simple graph first. Uh, we're going to come over on the side here. You can see that there is a column graph tool. You can just hit J if you want the hotkey for that. And we are going to click and drag. And it's just going to drag out an area. Now, it looks like we're making a square, but it's actually an area. And when we let go, boom, it's going to give us this chart. And now we're done. We did it. We made a graph. <laughs> Thanks for joining our episode, everyone. Whoa. Whoa. There it is. Num math. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so this is, I think, one of the only things in Illustrator that's like live interactive, which I think is really interesting. But what mm -hmm. we can do is we could come in here and we could just type in our number. So, you know, one, maybe our five, we have three, we have seven. And you see that it's not updating. What we need to do is click this little check mark and it will update all those for us. And you can see that it's it's rearranging everything, it's changing everything for exactly how we want it. Now, that's great, you can put in numbers individually, but like we don't have time for that because we are efficient here on this stream. We, we do things the right way. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna delete all those numbers and check this out. If we click right here, which is import data, uh, what I've done is I have exported Mm, there it is. Uh, I've exported veggie exports right here. So it's just a text file. This is the one in Discord, so you can download this. And we're gonna double click and watch what happens. It is brought in that data into our graph. So we have the year, we have all of our different categories, and we have all the numbers. Now, the problem with this is the year right now is going to display as a number. So it's it's basically going to read as if we have 2,021 <laughs> years, as if they were apples. So I'm going to delete these two. Actually, let's show you what happens. So if we hit apply, you'll see that the year is literally throwing off the whole graph. So I'm going to delete the entire year column real quick. Gotcha. And then hit plus, or sorry, the check mark, and it will apply. Checkmark. There you go. So check it out. Now we have all of these different things. And the great thing is with this uh, dialog box, whatever you put in the top row comes over here and breaks out into its own section. So you can see what correlates with what, right? And that's just vector art that you can manipulate, change size, everything. Yep. So if I want to, I can grab the direct selection tool and I can grab all of this type that is right here. And maybe we want this to be in Comic Sans. Uh, and let's do bold because we're classy. You can change you all go. of that. And the, the cool thing, check this out, is if I want to, uh, maybe I made an error and we actually had 90 grapes the first year. If we hit oh. 90, it's going to adjust this and keep that formatting. So it will keep the, the type all the same. Um, and you'll see that it actually has two graphs next to each other. Um, and what that's doing is it's comparing the year over year, right? The one year to the other. So if we select this, one row is one year and then the other row is the other one. So you can do comparisons if you want, or you can delete this bottom row and just have one. Uh, now Amazing. I want to do one more thing. Uh, and then we have a lot more to talk about. And this is how to do a, a pie chart. And I'm going to show you a couple different ways to push this pie chart. So we're going to come down here and we're going to click and hold on the graph tool and come down to the pie graph tool. And again, you guys can play around with all of these different graphs. There's a million different ways to do this. So we're going to click and drag, make our little square, and you can see now that we have a pie. Uh, it is a full pie, a whole pie, and we are going to only bring in one of our data sets. So I'm going to bring in that same data set again, downloads, click on veggie exports, 
And then I'm going to delete out a few of these. So we're going to take out the years. And right now, if we hit plus, you'll see that it's actually going to make two pie charts. And we don't want that. We just want one. So I'm going to delete the second year because that's not important. Maybe we just want one. There we go. And just like that, now we have this awesome pie chart, right? It's all live. If we wanted to, we could change these to maybe we made a mistake with grapes. We could do 27 and it would change it in live update for us. It also has all of the names over here as well. Now, if we want to, we can expand this and it's gonna make it so that we can't edit it anymore, but I wanna do this so I can show you. We're gonna go to object and expand and it's going to expand all of the pieces. All right. Mm, why didn't we expand here? Mm. We, yes. Oh, I don't think that I had saved the changes to the data. Graph, why are you hating me? Graph, object, <laughs> expand. Right, what joys? Okay, so let's do this. There we go. Oh, there we go. Ungrouped. Got it. Uh, all right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to make this a donut graph. So a, a, a quick kind of easy way to do this is to do a clipping mask. So we're simply going to make another circle in the middle here. Mm -hmm. And then one more circle that goes around the entire outside. I'll make those different colors so that you can see them. Boop. So there's two. We're going to select these two, right click and make a compound path. And Favorite. then check this. Yeah, literally, we just select all of it, right click and hit make clipping mask. And it's going to use that donut shape on the top. And it's going to clip it into a donut chart. So now we've got this nice little donut chart. We can click in here and change the center if we want. Uh, we can go in and change all of the different outlines if we want, uh, which I am going to do. So Everything's gonna... still live and totally editable. That's kind of cool. Yep. Yeah. So you can go in and change all of these different things. And we're just going to toss some different colors on these uh, just so you guys can kind of see. And then we're going to do something really crazy. Actually, there's a different thing that I also want to show you. No, not the same color, Andrew. Come on, pull it together now. Come on now. I'm I'm really trying, Nick. They would like you to uh, take that very last swatch and turn it to licorice. <laughs> licorice? <laughs> Oranges, apples, licorice. Yes, I love that. Uh, all right, so we have, we have our graph here. And what we could do, instead of doing all the clipping masks, right? Because who cares about clipping masks and compound path? And who, nobody has time for that. What we could do is just make a circle in the middle here and check this out. We've used this tool before, and you guys probably don't remember, but that's okay. If we select <laughs> all of this, you can come over here to the Shape Builder tool and watch this. Mm -hmm. If we hit Alt or Option, it's going to take out that center part and boom. Perfect. Now it's made that donut graph. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets really fun. And this is the last thing I'm going to show you. Then we'll go back and talk a little bit more. We're going to select our pie donuts uh, that we've used our uh, shape tool on. And we are going to go to Effect, 3D, and Extrude and Bevel. And this is how you make it look 3D. Love. This, right? this is that hidden thing on, on Illustrator that nobody knows. I yep. love the 3D effects. Oh my God, this is crazy. Yep, so you can click. And you know what? I actually need these grouped before I do that. So we're going to group it. And then we're going to go and type in the Extrude and Bevel. Uh, and there we go. So you can kind of drag around and see how it's working. You can click on more options and change the lights so that it is kind oh, of looking different. So killer. There we go. That's looking good. Um, and hit okay. And that's looking great. And the cool thing is if we want to do like a call out because of the way we've built this, we can use the direct selection tool and just grab one piece and then break it out. Mm -hmm. Right. And it keeps that cool 3d, um, so that it's continues to look like it is uh, all a part of it. We can also take a piece and scale it down and it will start yeah. to give us a little more of that kind of dynamic breakout, mm -hmm. all looking 3d, all having, uh, the effects of that crazy kind of engaging look and then we can take our key totally. and just drop it in next to it so those are a couple so different great. ways to use math in illustrator which is crazy you wouldn't think that you'd do it but here we are math exists i love it math is real y'all don't forget it um so nick we have some more things that we want to talk about and that is yeah. geometry and creativity we've got about 20 Let's minutes do it so we're going to kind of shift and talk a little bit of if you are the creative if you are a designer if you are uh kind of making things let's take a look and talk a little bit about uh maybe some principles that you would use in your design so the first is yeah the golden ratio what's the golden ratio nick you know what? I don't use it much. Do you? I don't either. No, we're, no. we're like supposed to, but I don't. 
It's, Are we supposed? I think we're supposed to say we do. Yes, we're but, supposed to say um, we do. Yeah. Uh, it's supposedly the ratio that is the most visually pleasing to the eye. It is based on the Fibonacci sequence, which is 0, 1, 1, yes. 2, 3. So it's basically the addition of the number before it and the number after it, so it continues to grow. Um, so yes. a lot of logos are built on the scale. It is a thing that has to do with math. Um, you can use it. I'm sure it's helpful. There is probably some rule that you're supposed to, but Nick and I don't, so... And sometimes it feels like a stretch yes. to me. Live your life. Yeah, We're not your moms. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go ahead and hop in and talk about some grids because we do use those. Um, Nick, yes. do you want to talk about grids with oh, all man. that fun stuff? This is perfect timing. We were literally just doing a one-on-one -on -one illustrator with students yesterday and today, and was using these exact same things where you're building your own guides in a way to make sure there's something here. So the in like the it's situation here with the Adidas one, it's maintaining some visual consistency by doing this stuff and the way they're lining up, the way they're lining up with the text underneath it, that consistency is, it might be, you know, subliminal. You might see it like not really off like the top of your head, but it's there for convenience. It's there for clarity. Yes. It's really, really cool. And Nick, we talked then, like, about this. Um, yeah. We talked about this when we talked about the Bauhaus movement that oh, uh, yeah. there's something called an implied grid and there's something that is a visual grid. And a lot of logos use an implied grid that you don't see it. But as you look at the logo, yeah. like the Adidas logo, you understand that there is an underlying grid that exists there, um, which exactly. I think is interesting that we're seeing it here. Yeah. And I love the Uber one, too, as simple as it is. And it just looks like someone, you know, picked a font and wrote UBER. But actually when it's hand created and crafted from the beginning, you can see all those little things that apply to it. And it helps this logo with just overall versatility. It works. There's this unity in fonts. That's why font design, I think, is such a tough thing to even try to yes. begin or master. And you see the results when it works this cleanly. It's yep. really nice. Absolutely. Um, some more logo grids here, some great examples. Yep. You want to create some organization and focus. That's how you, you can use that kind of um, the golden ratio grid and, and something as simple as the National Geographic one. It's there. But the cool one, too, is I love the grid here on the McDonald's one. This is there creating something very simple and very timeless. And what's more timeless than this logo? I don't think it's been like adapted or, or shifted in any way. It's been used since its birth in almost every aspect of McDonald's branding career. It's yes. incredible. So McDonald's a couple years ago, and y'all should look up a YouTube video on this. I don't know what it's called, but uh, McDonald's a few years ago did a brand audit and they went through all the mm -hmm. different stores that had been built over time, all the different signs that they had at different stores. And they found that there were 37 different variations of their wow. logo being used. Um, from you know signage signage that someone had ordered that like came out a little bit Squashed weird or whatever it. yeah or maybe we have just the golden arch maybe we have the green version that happens in other countries because they don't have the red uh, there's a blue version of McDonald's to where it's blue and yellow uh, and so they went through and audited and it was like oh this logo that we thought was super standardized is actually chaotic because of this scale that it had to roll out at yeah which is why these guides are so essential <laughs> oh and my brand guidelines are such the bible they you got to pull right from the art there and you can you got to obey the rules they tell yep. you don't stretch it don't bend it don't turn it into this color yep and a great question Perfect coming example. in jan uh are grids useful for everything you do in illustrator even for artwork I think there's a certain area where play is more important. It's particularly if you're just doing something for the sake of just creative art and some artwork. Maybe not. I think it's more forced when you need it to be pleasing, you need it to be relevant, and you need it to be somewhat some synergy in there. You know, lining these things up and using the guides is helpful. I agree. And I think that there is a time when it needs to be organic, and there is a time that it needs mm -hmm. to be on a grid. Um, yeah. Which one of the times that it probably needs to be on a grid logos and construction lines. Let's talk about this, Nick. Yeah. Look at this one. So the lines of the grid can really help you see more options for where to draw and where the lines will kind of help the eye move and everything. And what's interesting about this is I love this one because to me, I can look at that logo on its own and think, okay, it's nice. But when you can start to see where the a and the paper airplane, do kind of find some paths there, or whatever. What this allows you to do is maybe see things like, look at the way they cut the air, the airplane off on the far left edge. Yep. Like it gives you that ability to go like, ooh, there's something there I wouldn't thought of unless I saw the grid or the lines over my artwork. So 
I think in some ways it helps to your creativity as well. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Um, all right. I actually have an example of that that I want to show real quick. Let's see um, it. And I know that you want to do some like hands-on demo. So if we want to hop into that while I find this file, okay, um, cool. if you want to talk a little bit about, uh, Nick's got some examples of kind of the stuff that he was talking about. So I'm yeah. going to go over there, Nick, and you can take it away. I was trying to think of some things that would be that are in multiples, that are in grid-based, or anything that's like that. And the first one, I've always had this kind of idea that I build my files per piece. But when I have a piece that I have multiple files within it, why not add it into one particular uh, AI thing? And what's neat about this is duplicate artboards. To me, this was something that I never really messed around with. But if you just do shift and drag and get these over here, I can actually make duplicates Let's say I need to make four SKUs of a particular product or something like this. With the drag and shift, I'm literally doing this and getting all these things, and now I can mess around with these. They're all in one file. And to me, this idea of multiple artboards, um, I remember seeing it years ago and going like, I know how to do that, but let me just double check. Here's a great way to do it. For me, uh, it works out so nicely. Um, you, if you need to add a new one, you're literally grabbing the artboard and you're making your own. You have all the digits here for your dimensions. So everything's there if you have to make it a custom size. Um, the next thing I want to show you guys is making your own grid. And when you have like an artboard here, what I've typically done is I'll make a shape right next to it like this or right on top of it. And to make your own grid, you're going to go to object and then to path and then to split into grid. And what you get is this neat little dialogue here. And what I can do is I can go 10, and I'm gonna give it a little gap, so like maybe 0 0.05, and then 10 again here. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna give me a unique grid. Let's say this is something I need, I'm going for this, and what I can do now is turn, now that I've just done this grid, I can actually make it into guides. So by view, and then guides, and then make guides, what that's done for me is I've actually made a guide. You can see the light blue, just like you would if you were to be have a ruler over here and you'd be bringing out a rule for this. If you have snap to, to guides on, now you're drawing within here and you can see it's actually finding those areas and it's making it easy. So if there's a certain proportion or size ratio that you want to be in that logo and you're using it over and over again, it's really kind of neat to mess around with that. Yeah, absolutely. Next up, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, you keep going. Okay, so mesh distortion. If you've built a grid or you have any kind of image and you're trying to do that distortion or that liquefy, we typically go to Photoshop for these things. But what I did here was I've just made a grid. This is basically a square repeated over and over again. Imagine if this was your art and you wanted to distort this with a grid mesh on there. You basically go to object, Envelope Distort, if you're not using Envelope Distort, it is one of the greatest little tools throughout Illustrator. And then we're gonna make with mesh. And what this does, I can make it 10 rows, 10 columns, whatever I want. Let's just make it 15 by 15, and I hit here. Now, with the Direct Select tool, if I grab any of these pieces here, hold on, there it is. You can see what I'm doing is I'm actually manipulating the artwork that was there if you're trying to do some liquefy or something like that i can grab multiple like this and, and actually move if you're looking at how to do this uh literally two mm -hmm. days ago the illustrator daily creative challenge that i taught was all yeah. about meshes all about distortion we made a gig poster like a 70s gig poster so if you want to yeah go back and watch that uh, just bns.net slash challenge slash illustrator um it's up there That's for the next awesome. few days and you can like really get into this style yeah and it's neat too because you're getting uh, just not flat graphics anymore from vector. You're actually finding cool ways to do it. Um, another good thing is when you're repeating, when you want multiples of a thing, particularly in radial, um, there's now tools to do this, which just make it so easy. Radial so repeat. if I grab this circle here, we're going to go to object, repeat, and radial. All of a sudden, I get this great little tool. I'll zoom in a little bit here. And you can see I have some control here. So this is allowing me how many circles do I want to repeat like that. And then this one gives me the steps. How many do we want in there? And what's neat is you almost get that spirograph effect, yes. which is kind of cool. But also you can now grab these tools. and You can actually get in there and even manipulate more, make the radius here bigger. 
and you can see this is just the cool stuff. Now you get these really cool things. I can zoom in a little bit more. You can see maybe because I have this at a higher, uh, I'll go down a stroke or two. There you go. So if you're trying Ooh. to get, think of those AT&T logos or the things that provide grids. I could take this really quick and just expand it. And now I actually have vector art. That would take me hours to build in some other way, shape or form, right? Yep. And the last one I got is the grid repeat. And I, I, I love Pattern Maker, use that a lot, but this is kind of unique. So with the grid repeat, have any kind of icon. This is great for like seamless patterns. If you're building something that does match up um, on both sides, there's some matching component. Even just for a logo, it works. You take object and then you go repeat. Where is repeat? There it is. And let's go to grid. All right, perfect. So now same like that radial one, we have controls here to mess around with how many we want. We can slide this one here, slide this one here. But the cooler thing, let's go back to that. We're gonna go to object, repeat, and options. Look at this, so now I can make these staggered. I can actually mess around with them staggered here. We can flip the one below it. Ooh. So all of a sudden you're actually, what's neat about this is you might find, I know when I try to take a logo and make a pattern out of it, sometimes it just looks too forced and it's not really like nesting too well. Yeah. But you find the right combination here. Like, look at that. That's great. I don't know if that's right. You get this neat pattern here and there's so many cool ways to do it. And again, you're just messing around. I can go with spacing. I can overlap them. I can get these really cool ideas here as well. Nick, so do you know what cool this stuff. is called? There's a specific term for this idea of repeating a logo in different orientations. Quiz trivia. No. It is called uh. tessellation. Uh, so these, wow. these are tessellations. I, I always end up doing this with logos. And back yeah. when I was in house, people were like another tessellation. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just have to do it every time. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just something that happens. It really is. I love that word. That's uh, a great one. Man. And our friend Jan is saying that she just added illustrator to her CC plan. Welcome. Welcome to the world of illustrator. This is a great place to learn more as well as the illustrator daily creative challenges that happen every day, 1130 AM Pacific standard time. Shameless. Yeah. For those. Um, and Mimi saying, I need to try this with my logo. Yes, you do. Um, yep. All right, Nick, can I that's show uh, Mimi? That's homework. Yes, that's the homework. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show real quick, Nick, uh, talking Let's about see. grids and guides, uh, this logo that I worked on. So they brought me on to, uh, do a, a brand. It was called like an intermediary brand. It was an odd project, but we, we basically revised our logo. I got in there and I was like, um, this is not a preference thing. The logo is actually wrong. Like there are actual wrong issues with this. And so started to put everything on the grids and this is what their logo was. And I pointed out these angles are all different. This one, who knows what's going on here. Uh, every distance is different between the letters. Like all of the technicalities of this are not going oh, right. Oh yes. Right. Um, I also looked at the roundness of all of these edges and what the degree of roundness was, and they were all different as well. And so what I did is I went in and revised their logo so that everything was 15 pixel round, 45 pixel round, every, uh, parallel. Yep. Everything is a parallel. Everything is even. And this is something that now they're using at smaller sizes. Like it just helped to refine a little bit and you can kind of see the before and after, uh, it makes yes. it so it's more scalable. It feels a little more locked in and things are just a little more professional. Uh, and so that's what the power of a yeah. grid can do, right? There was zero design happening here in my brain of like, I, let's get creative. Think, it was just yeah. grids. You brought up a great point that I've used this probably more to prove a point with a logo that was already done yes. and to show a client where the inconsistencies, where the, where the incorrect areas are. And uh, you see a lot of people do this on like uh, brand new and all those other ones. When a new logo comes out, people just love putting an overlay and like people like, I think it was the LA Rams logo that a lot of people did that too. Yep. And just to show some of the inconsistencies there, but yep. that's a great idea. Yeah. It's funny. I use that more than I do in my actual work. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we do have homework for y'all this week and that homework is to go into discord. Uh, well, well, there's more, but go into discord and download this text file right here for the veggie exports. And we want you to make a graph, make a grid 
Um, maybe your logo, you do something that Nick showed, you repeat it. Maybe you put it on a grid or maybe you synthesize some data. I've given you a little bit of data here and maybe you make a chart or a graph, try to export it in 3D, see what it looks like as a scatter plot. Um, play around with the different tools Ooh. in Illustrator and synthesize some of this data into Illustrator. You also can join and again, just hang out in our Discord. It's a great place to get connected, but there is homework and we want you to post that homework right here in the homework channel. Um, I'll go ahead and drop the files in there for you as well so you can keep working and that way we can see what we're all creating together um and nick it is nearing the end of the show we have one more thing that we want to do that we do every week that can come out of discord you can nominate your friends drum roll nick what is the end of the show this week what are we doing student of the week that's right and this week it is mariana solis uh a student in uh costa rica uh pura vida i love costa rica I used to uh, live there for a little while so uh this is incredible work it's just amazing amazing work uh wade the link is mariana solis three um sorry i need to give you these before the show but here we are nick which one do we want to look at we have time to look at one of these projects and really highlight it and just celebrate the amazingness that is there Ooh, want to look at the Beatles one real quick. I know that might be, oh, there might be music, I would Let's assume, maybe. Oh, we don't have that kind of budget for this show. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah no. Sorry, we don't have <laughs> Beatles music. Click that budget. Button. Let's hop into nope. the Mars branding one. Let's do that. Yeah, let's see. Where is that one? Mars the branding. The very first one. At the top. Ooh. Right? Well, I would say my first comment would be, she knows color. Oh, yes. She has a color palette. It's very, really rich very original i love this vibe oh i love when oh. she this is great nick look at the logo constructions we literally talked about this today that it is based on grid oh look at that oh my goodness love it That's i thought you were gonna say she did she did some applications on balloons <laughs> Did she? Are there balloons? <laughs> no, oh. I thought you were going to say that. I almost That's got the new so trend. excited. Um, so when you're laying out kind of a brand standard and defining a guide, I love stuff like this to where you show the no-goes of like, here's what you don't yeah. do. Um, and I think it's interesting because this brand has a very specific list that you would think that some of these would be acceptable, but they're not. Yeah. Uh, and I love yeah. brands that are specific like that. I think it's not that – this is an interesting one. It's not that most of those are bad. It's just like you said with the McDonald's one, why go down a path where you have 18 varieties of a logo that are working? Yes. D limit it to something and then better brand consistency down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is your take on – uh, no, that's probably not it. Never mind. No words. Uh, I love – Love the swirling of the logo down below. Keep going a little bit. There you go. Oh, that to me. That's what that is. And then it, it's been used. It almost feels like tie dye or something, where the where, where now where she's got it on the um, some of those blocks there to the left. Yes, you know I love that. That's, that's pretty killer. That's interesting because I saw it happening. And I was like, oh, that's a really cool like lava lamp texture. And then you're like, when she like twisted it, I was like, what are you talking about? And then I saw the GIF Here's and I was like, oh my from. gosh, it's not a texture. It's like- It is typography. A full twist typography. And then yeah, used as a texture in so many different places. Oh, I love this idea. This is great. This is great. I love that there are so many good Behance examples now for all of us to look at and see. Like we, we spent the first year of office hours really, you know, pushing that you this is the level you got to you got to be at this is where you can lay out a great case study with not a lot of you don't have to tell a huge story but you've got enough here to walk them through yep and let's look at the grooves again real quick because i think that this is a trend and nick what do you think about this of including gradients in your color palettes for things i actually just had to update a client because yeah. they wanted gradients as a part of their uh color palette what, what's your take on that I, I, I think in the right way, I think the way she's using it, I do like it because she has added a texture. There's some uniqueness to those gradients. It's not just three colors flushing through. To me, it feels like there are there's lighting on them and everything. But more importantly, I do like when you have that grit in there as well. Um, my fear is too, sometimes they're so overused a person can confuse a, a company with gradients with another company with gradients. Absolutely. I, I agree. To be honest with you. I agree. You know, um, what do we call this new font thing here? Uh, her, the grooves logo type. It's I, I'm seeing this so much. Can we, can we call this something? What do you call it? This I don't trend? know. I call it like woobly type, I guess is how I would it's reference. Like, what'd you call it? Woobly type. Woobly. I was going to say like wavy, 
it feels melted a little bit. Like, yeah, it's very uncertain. Like we went from stretchy mm-hmm. letters to just like weird like wave letters. Yeah, and I like that this is happening because after so many years of minimalist design just being such a trend, I want to see character back into type. Yeah, yeah look at squiggle, I'm, wobbly, groovy. I'm not I love it. bored of it yet is my hot take on that. <laughs> I'm not bored of it yet. Yet. It's coming. Yet. It's, it's right around. It's, the, it's, it's right, right around the corner. corner. Right um, the corner. So yeah. that's all we have. One more thing that we didn't get to today that I do want to point out is um, a great example of an annual report. If you're looking to synthesize some data and just a great example of uh, kind of showing a bunch of that data, girls who code.com slash 2018 report. This is an amazing annual report that uses a lot of the techniques that we talked about today uh, to really show off how you can visualize data really, really well. So girls who code.com slash slash 2018 report. Uh, and with that, Wonderful. it's the end of the show, Nick. What advice do you have? Sign us off. Take it away. Oh, man. Take a math break and then get back into it on Monday. I'm We're creatives. Give give yourself two days off of math. We've done enough. Yeah. Don't, don't do your homework. How about that? Don't do your homework till next week. And do it we'll on Monday. S- yeah. Do it on Monday. We'll see you next week for Adobe Office Hours. Bye, everybody. Great weekend.